Thank you for the time of worship that we've had so far, and we pray, um, God, that you would do a, a great work this morning. Uh, speak to our hearts, and Father, may we be uh, different as we leave this place and be challenged to, to uh, walk with you more. And if, Lord, if we don't know you as Savior, as Lord, uh, I pray today will be the day of salvation. And so, Father, we uh, pray that your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. So, uh, just to let you know, I'm, I'm an electric guitarist too, so this is beautiful. This is, this is eye candy right here. This is nice. This is nice. But uh, as, as we're told, my name is Ben Bailey. Um, I am uh, currently serving um, down in uh, Oldie, and uh, not too far from here. Um, have been for the last 12 years, and uh, it's been clear that uh, God is moving in our hearts and to uh, transition us into a different position. And, um, and it's been very clear, uh, in particular, calling us here. And uh, so it, it's, uh, it's our goal and desire to, uh, to see um, God work through this in a, in a mighty way. Um, and, and what we get to chat about this morning is, uh, is talking about prayer. And uh, this has been a vital and important part of our lives. Uh, my wife, Sarah, and uh, it's been such an important part of, of seeing God work in the midst of uh, turmoil, in the midst of transition, in the midst of change. And um, it, it is uh, our privilege to be able to, to share uh, this morning um, just with what God's Word has to say uh, about prayer. And um, so uh, I was talking with uh, Pastor Paul, and uh, you guys are, you know, I'll just tell you, just start off, um, what a blessing uh, to, to get to know him, and what a, a tremendous uh, man that he is. And, uh, and a, an incredible uh, calling that God has called him to help um, this church transition um, through processes. And, uh, and he's, he's a great guy, and I'm super thankful to get to know he and Leslie, and uh, who is his better half, and he would tell you that. Um, but she really is awesome as well. So, but um, you guys have been going through, uh, going through the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, in particular in Matthew. And I'll tell you this, um, my wife and I, uh, we like to go on walks. We like to uh, just to get our blood flowing because both of us sit all day, right, um, with our jobs. And uh, so we go on walks and we were walking as my wife asked, she goes, well, what are you thinking about sharing on when we uh, go up to Grace? I said, you know what, particularly I'd love to share on prayer um, because it, you know, such a vital and important part of our lives and I'd love to, to teach you particularly. Um, about what Jesus has to say about prayer within the Sermon on the Mount. Do you guys realize that this is the next step from what y'all studied last week? <laughs> so I, I, I just blew it away. Amen. It's, it's just it's so cool. So in particular, I, I, I talked to Paul and I said, hey Paul, um, I've been thinking about uh, talking about prayer in verses uh, chapter six in Matthew verses five sixteen, um, where what did y'all study last time? He said uh, chapter six one through four. <laughs> <laughs> I said what? Are you serious? He said yeah. I said well you know I don't want to step on your toes. I don't want to get in the middle of your series. He goes no do it go go for it. Um, he said that y'all have a guest speaker next week and then he's going to be uh, back on the twentieth sharing. And, uh, and then he asked, he said, because uh, I told him I'd like to break up the prayer from verses 5 to 8 and then 9 to 16. Um, he said, why don't you do 9 to 16 when you come back on the 27th, and I'll jump to fasting, which is right after that. And uh, so um, you get the first half of the prayer this week, and then uh, when I come back on the 27th, um, you'll have the second half. So we'll get the full full. The full gamut here, right? So in particular, uh, we're going through talking about Jesus being the good teacher. The good teacher, and, and which he is. There's no one like him. There is no one who has ever been, nor will they ever be, uh, a, a flesh human being like Jesus. 100% God, 100% man. That's spiritual math. <laughs> Doesn't make sense to us because you can't have more than 100%, right? No. 100% God, 100% man, yeah, spiritual man. Um, 
So the series we're going through is talking about a good teacher. We're talking about a good teacher in particular, the Sermon on the Mount, starting verse six or chapter six into chapter seven um, on uh, the Sermon on the Mount. There is we're going to be talking about the, the it's entitled the Life of Grace. And so, um, in particular, we've been going through different stages and talking about different things that go with part of life as as being the meaning of of grace in our lives, seeing the grace that comes about in particular within our lives. So, last week we talked about verses 1 through 4 of chapter 6, and and you said you're talking about getting to the needy. And in particular, there's a main focus of uh, the motives behind it. And I think giving to the needy, we can all state that giving to the needy is a very important thing to do. And it's in fact, it's what Jesus taught is to be done. But there's, but there's more than just giving to the needy. It's, it's what heart we give to the needy with. And the same fact comes into, in verses 5 to 8, about the motive of our heart in prayer. So I think as we start, we started last week talking about getting to the medium of motives. It brings us to the point of where are our motives in prayer? So this is just four verses, and you're thinking, how in the world are you going to sermon in four verses? Um, this, is a, this is how we're going to do it. So uh, just a little background uh, within myself. I'm not up here to talk about myself, but I just give the background in prayer. Um, I grew up with the privilege of having my grandmother and my grandfather live with me. Um, I have two wonderful parents, and it was my mother's parents that lived with us. When I was 11 years old, we moved out of the house uh, that we currently lived in, and moved into a house, that a larger house, that had uh, what was referred to as an in-law suite. Uh, I guess it was because of my dad's, it was my dad's in-laws, uh, right? And, uh, and so they had their own entrance into the house, they could walk around the back, and it's own entrance, and it was a full apartment and basement. And uh, so I just want to be clear that when I said my parent, my grandparents lived in our basement that they weren't chained. So I just want to just clarify it was a very nice life, okay? Um, and I say privilege because uh, both of my parents are the youngest of four children. And, um, and in particular, both of their parents were 36 years old when they were born. So um, my parents didn't get married until they were 30 and 29. So. I was born a year and a half after my parents got married. My grandparents were a lot older than me. And uh, I'm I'm 40 years old. My grandparents were born in 1910. All four of them. So uh, they're they're not living, just to let you know. Um, Just in case you were like, wow, it's a miracle. Um, But uh, but I had the privilege of living with my grandparents. And uh, my my mother's parents um, left a major legacy in my life. And uh, in, in our in our children's lives, um, I, I state that because it's the, the same uh, family that Blair Benjamin comes from, uh, who married Becky Gallo from here. Same legacy, same family, and um, it's really interesting to, to see it how it comes full throttle. But I had the privilege of living with them, and so when uh, I'm, I'm a, a very much a people person. So anytime I would get something or I'd go shopping and I'd buy something, you know, we didn't have online buying. So when we actually went to a store, you brought it home. And then when you got it, you, you were able to run down and show your grandparents what you got, right? So that was what I loved to do. Um, in particular, when I was in seventh grade, I walked in, I got these brand new pair of basketball shoes, seventh grade. I was going to start playing basketball for the first time. I was really excited. And uh, so I got these, these nice shoes. And uh, so I ran downstairs, and I went to go uh, show my grandparents. And I run around the corner, and my grandma and grandpa, they couldn't hear me, because um, they couldn't hear me. Well. And, uh, but, but they were listening to one another. And in particular, I came around the corner, and I saw what they were doing. My grandparents had a manila, a manila paper, no, it's a manila folder, yellow paper, you know, in the tear away sheets, whatever. Um, and what they had was sheets and sheets of things that they prayed for. And they would go and, and look at the Word of God and pray the Word of God over this sheet of prayer requests that they had. Sorry, I'm going to choke up. My name was on there three times. And I knew that I was being prayed for by my grandparents. 
I knew how important that meant to me. But it was out of a witness of seeing them do that that challenged me in my prayer life. Because as my grandparents were 86 and 87 years old at this time, I, I went down and was looking at them and seeing them pray over their family member, pray over their friends, to pray over them. And it's not just like I'm praying for their cat's hangnail. You know, it's like I'm praying. I'm praying for them and their spiritual well-being. I'm praying that they would give God honor and glory with their lives. That they would be a reflection of Jesus. See, when my grandfather passed away, when I was a senior in high school, right before I graduated, um, the grandsons were the pallbearers of him. And there were nine of us wrapped around that were able to attend, and we carried his body to the grave. And as we did that, we, uh, we set his body before it, they brought it down to the ground, and we, we sang the doxology around his gravesite. My family is also very musically inclined, the pastor said that that's the best doxology he's ever heard um, because of us we we're being able to sing it together. And I say that not to say, hey, you know, they're all great singers. I'm sharing that because that's the legacy that my grandparents left behind. And that's the very same legacy that I, myself, and my wife want to leave behind as well. But God's given us this opportunity to be able to share his word. And when I saw my grandparents praying, it was what they were praying for and their motives behind praying that transformed everything. So if you would, once you turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, we're going to be looking at just four verses. I'll tell you this, I'm not an old person, but I will recognize I went and bought a new Bible and uh, it in particular came as a large print Bible where the words are real big. And I'll be honest, I'm not hating it. Okay? <laughs> I'm not hating it. I can see it from here. I can see it from here. Alright? So, I guess it was fourth thought here. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> verse, five, or, yeah, verse 5 in chapter 6 says this. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who has seen what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So this passage starts with three words. When you pray. So what's implied is that we pray. So yes, this, this in particular, these four verses talk about, they in particular talk about uh, how not to pray. And then in three weeks, we'll talk about how to pray. But there's some truths that we can take about how not to pray to apply to our lives. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. But it says when you pray. Now, if you go through Scripture, we, we uh, in particular, when we look at prayer, this is in particular talking about a plea for prayer. And it's, it's calling out what we are to do, that we are to pray, and how we are to pray. But the first part, it says, when you pray. Now, when we look through Scripture, it says there's different ways that we can look at it, right? There's ways to say, um, we can say, uh, look at the lives of people that have prayed in the past. Right? So when we think of it, when I think of a great prayer, in particular in the Old Testament, I immediately think of Daniel, right? Who, who went to the window to pray, and it cost him to be thrown into the lion's den, right? It, it, it's what ended up taking place. But he wasn't willing to give that up because he knew that his desire was to draw near to God through a relationship in prayer and talking back to God. But we, we, don't, we don't pray like that. We, we often don't pray like that. There's the psalmist in chapter 119 that says that he prayed seven times a day. 
We don't pressure that. <laughs> there's, a, there's some challenging ones in the New Testament. When you look at Acts uh, chapter 2, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 2, um, Anna, the, who was uh, in particular in Scripture, talks about when she worshiped and prayed, that she worshiped and prayed all day and all night. We don't pray that. So often, when we get to a point of prayer, and we look at Scripture, we think, oh, well, I don't pray like them, so I'm not going to pray. I can't pray all day and all night. I can't pray seven times a day. I can't get on my knees by a window and pray three times a day. We often, we often look at prayer as being something that we're, if we're not good at it, we don't end up doing it. And so what our challenge to do this morning is, I want us to look at prayer for what it was. I mean, Jesus went an entire day and prayed all day and all night. If, if you don't get anything from this sermon, <laughs> I have a theme that I just want you, that as we look at these, these, uh, these verses, I want us to, to, to walk away from it. And the theme is this, it says, when we pray, communicate with the rewarder, and experience liberty that comes with a sincere heart. And remember what Christ has done. You can take this entire section of prayer and boil it down to these few words. Again, when we pray, communicate with the rewarder and experience the liberty that comes with a sincere heart. And remember what Christ has done. First thing I want us to look at, right? First point is not like the hypocrites. Not like the hypocrites. Verses 5 and 6, I just want to read them again just to refresh our memory. It says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they pray, or, I'm sorry, but they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you that uh, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your father, who has seen what is done in secret, will reward you. Now, to give us a little context of what this is, you can take this overall theme of talking about not to the hypocrites, and looking at it is that we are praying to an audience of one. We are praying to an audience of one. That's what, that's unlike what the hypocrites were praying, um, in particular that Jesus was talking about. Now, religious leaders in that time were often known as being ones that are uh, to be seen as holy, and they wanted to be seen that way. They were ones that wanted to pray, and when they prayed, they wanted to stand on street corners. They wanted to make sure everyone had, hey, 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 I'm getting ready to pray. Everybody pay attention. That's the way they were. And so when Jesus says, hey, hey, see that person up there praying? Don't pray like that. Don't pray like that. Public, it's not that he going against public prayer. Because public prayer is a vital important. You can see that Jesus went about doing that. But public prayer is very useful practice, but the audience is to be the audience of one. Now you might be thinking, where have I heard audience of one before? So there's, a, there's been a song that's been written about it, and particularly more current. Uh, there's a quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles that started a foundation called Audience of One. His name's Carson Wentz. Um, in particular, he has this like logo that, uh, I don't know if you know this, but they started selling his Audience of One t-shirts at the stadium. Um, and that's what it is pointing to, is to point to Jesus and his relationship with Jesus and how he plays and everything that he does is for an audience of one. Now that hits home for us, right? Like, wow, it's Sunday. It's God, then football. Right? right? And that football player is playing for an audience of one. All right, now it's more Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. But the audience of one goes and it serves to underprivileged people, but more importantly, it's pointing to the audience of one. But the hypocrites, again, let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, much like uh, the hypocrites were uh, wanted to be seen by others, but much like giving and fasting all throughout Scripture, we'll talk about fasting in a couple weeks. The goal is is that the goal is to be seen. Is that's a problem? If the goal is to be seen in fasting and prayer, then there's a problem. If the goal is to be seen in our giving, that's a problem, because again, it is to be for God. And it says that the hypocrites in particular, that they love to. Jesus uses those words, they love to. It means that that was their goal. 
So their posture uh, of sitting or standing or kneeling, um, even being face down, was not the problem. Jesus says that the problem is that, that Scripture um, goes against doing this for anyone other than God. Right? And then, Jesus gets sarcastic. You think, wait, what? Look at his response. Look at his response. He says, truly, they have received their reward in full. It means like, that's the end of the line. Anybody that comes up to them and says, hey, you know what, you are an incredible prayer. Thank you so much for doing that. He's like, if they're doing it with the wrong hearts, then that's their reward of their praise that they're getting from men. Because I can assure you that they're not getting it from God. We, we, we look at Jesus in response, and in the way that he responds to this, that he was, that these people were doing it to the praise of man and not to God. So the question goes to us is, who are we praying to when we pray? When we pray, is it what Jesus, it's not what, who we're praying, right? It's he's talking about it, to the heart, right? To the heart of, is it with a sincere heart? Is it to glorify God? But look at, in particularly, we talks about this, it being in secret. He says that it is to be in secret. It says, true, it says in verse 6, it says, But when you pray, go into a room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. See, the goal here was to be, if it's going to be a distraction for you to publicly pray in front of everyone else, because you want to be seen, then go into a door. Go into a room, shut the door, and pray to God by yourself. Because the goal is not to be seen when we pray. The goal is to pray to God. Pray to the audience of one. It's not to show off. It's not to be. Our attitude when we pray is, is, to have a, is to be sincere. And that's an important part of what we're looking at here. We are far less likely to be a hypocrite if we're alone in a room and praying just to God. It is difficult in this, in this family sense. Right? If you have a family, it is, it is hard to get alone and to find time to pray. Unless you wake up really, really early. Right? Really early. I try to wake up before my kids get up so that I can have some alone time with the Lord before they get up. And now listen, as they get older, my, my early time gets earlier. Right? With high school, the bus comes at 645. That's early. Some of you are like, Two hours by then. Or power to you. God has not called me to that life. <laughs> I love what Ecclesiastes chapter 5 says. I'll just read it for you, uh, but feel free to turn it if you'd like. Um, prayer is, is to be uh, for no one else. Um, but but this is what the, the Ecclesiastes chapter 5 uh, says. It says, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. <clears throat> go near to listen rather than to offer sacrifices of fools who do not know what they do is wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are in earth, on earth. So let your words be few. I was in a song once. Uh, it, it's in particular, it says, let your words be few. So when we're praying, it does not have to be this long, drawn-out statement. In fact, the, the writer of Ecclesiastes, for most of them were written by Solomon, says that your words are to be few. So it doesn't have to be long and drawn out. In particular, Jesus says that. Don't be long and drawn out with those that are talking to the pagans. No, don't, don't be like that. And just, if you're going to keep it simple, keep it simple. The great philosopher Augustine says this. It says, remove from prayer much speaking, not much praying. I love that statement. It's important for us to, to guard our hearts and making sure that, like we, when we say, you know, all right, am I going to guard my heart? No, we ask God to guard our hearts. 
He's the one that does the work in our lives. We don't have the capability of being able to do anything outside of his power and his work that is to be of any good in this world. He gives us the ability to be able to do that. But the first thing I want us to look at is, is to pray, not like the hypocrites. Pray to the audience of one. Second thing I want us to look at, verses 7 and 8, it says, not like the Gentiles. All right, so you know, that one, that one kind of hit home, right? So if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile, right? They're all throughout Scripture. So when Jesus says, not like the Gentiles, you know, oh, he threw me under the bus here. But here, this, this, there's a picture to that. I want us to look at it. It says, in sincere, I want us to pray with sincere, sincerity, with liberty. So look at what it says here. It says, and when you pray, do not keep babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because their words are many. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask them. So there's, there's some challenges here that come within our prayer life also. We can get uh, stuck in ruts. Am I right? We can get stuck in ruts. We can say, uh, you know, we become ritualistic, right? How often do, when you pray for your meal, let's say that's often the one that we most get successful, is praying for our meals. When we're praying for our meals, are, are we saying the same thing repeatedly? No, we have a tendency to do so. I know in particular, I have to think about it before I go about to do it. All right, I need to change this up a little bit. I don't want, I don't want people that, I mean, here I'm talking about what people think about my prayer. Um, but I don't want to teach. There we go way of saying it. I don't want to teach uh, my children or anyone else that, that uh, you only pray one certain way. And this is, this is convicting. This is convicting in this. But, but our prayer life is not to be ritualistic or mechanical, long or repetitious. It's not to have those type of, of, uh, of adjectives. It's more importantly to be sincere with liberty. And I, I really love the word liberty there. In Acts 19, uh, there's a silversmith that it, it talks about when he prayed to their gods, that he prayed for two hours. So if we're praying to anything outside of the Creator God, then we're praying in vanity. And Jesus, that's, that's the opposite of what Jesus is referring to, of what we should be doing. One of my favorite passages in Scripture, I have lots of favorites, and you'll, you'll, you'll hopefully get to know that about me. Um, but in particular, in 1 Kings 18, there's this connection um, uh, about Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Many of us have, might have know this story. But if you don't, there's this time where uh, Elijah is calling these people uh, to, to pray. He wants to, them to experience the power of his Lord, the power of the, of the true, one true God. And these prophets of Baal come over and they said... Um, they said, well, no, no, that's, that's not the way it's going to be. The, the, the prophets of Baal, that's the way it is. That, that's who we worship. And he says, all right, well, let's, let's have this contest. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make these couple sacrifices. And, and you, put, you build your, 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 your stones and you put your two bowls on there. And we'll make a sacrifice right now. But I don't want you to do anything. I want you to call fire from heaven. And we'll let the true God be the one who wins this. I, you know what I love about Elijah? Because he truly believed in the faith of what he's calling these people to do, that God was going to win. And he knew it. And I think that's the very same place that Jesus is calling us to know about within our prayer lives. So, let's finish the, the story in. Elijah builds his altar, right? Puts the two bowls on there. And not only does he do that, but he, what he does is he says, I want you to, I want you to cover it in water. Fire doesn't burn on water. He says, okay, so they pour water on it. They, they said before that, then they put, they put three, three uh, I forgot what the word is, but anyway, it comes out to be 24 pounds of seed as a sacrifice on top of this. And then they covered that in water. You know, seed absorbs water, so the water stays, it doesn't dissipate. And then they did it a third time, covered it in water. And they said there was a trench around this altar that was filled with water. So here you have Baal, doesn't have any water on it. All right? If this is truly God, I want you to call fire from heaven and then burn this up. So they start, they start chanting over and over Baal, over Baal, over Baal, and nothing's happening. And it, another sarcastic remark happens in the scripture. It's kind of funny. But Elijah goes, oh, uh, your God must be on vacation. Because <laughs> he's not there. 
Because let, let, me, let me come back here, and, and this is, let me teach you about the one true God. And he prays and says, God, may it be known that you are the one true God that you offer this sacrifice, that I offer this sacrifice to you. For you alone be the honor and glory. You don't know what happens. Fire comes from heaven. So hot that it burned up all the stones. And everything went straight to the ground. There was no water or anything that was left. That is to whom we are praying to. The one who could make fire come from heaven and burn up the rocks. With that comes fear. But in a respectful way. So when we're to pray, we're not to pray with absurdity, but to pray with faith. Knowing that the one we're praying to is the one true God. Elijah modeled what Jesus is pointing to, and I think that's the heart concept that I want us to understand. This sincerity with liberty, and in particular the word liberty, look at, look at, just think of freedom, right? He prays with this, this composed mindset. And this faith-filled petition as he prays to God to light this altar on fire. It's the very same prayer that Jesus is praying to. Martin Luther said that prayer should be brief. It should be fervent and intense. I love those words because I think that the picture that we're to look about within our prayer lives, it needs to be brief, Meaning, not be right, it can only be short, but, but to make sure that it is intentional. And that when we're praying, we're not, just, we're not just going about being ritualistic and saying the same thing over and over and over. But making sure that we are connecting with God in this way. Because Jesus gives us great liberty and great latitude in understanding this. Uh, one of the commentators I read about this was great. says this, says, don't put yourself in a straitjacket when Jesus is giving you wings to fly. I love that picture. Because when we pray, we are to experience the liberty that comes with prayer to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. When we recognize who we're praying to, it changes everything. It changes our perspective. It changes the way that we pray. The Father doesn't need long prayers because of any, there is no lack of information, right? He knows what we need. Our God can discern this. Look at what he says in verse 8. He says, your father knows what you need before you ask him. To me, this is one of the great mysteries about God. How he knows before I know what I'm thinking. We think, hey, I know what I'm thinking. Well, God knows it before I even thought it. That's one of the mysteries of God. And then it goes into our prayer life. It says, God knows what you're going to pray for before you even pray. But it goes even further. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 says this. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. But look what it does in our weakness. It says this. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with wordless groans. that the Holy Spirit prays what we ought to be praying for, that we do not know what we need to be praying for before God. The Spirit intercedes on our behalf in that way. To me, it's mind-blowing. Before I even know it, God is, is, is the Spirit is praying for us to the Father. Before we even know it. When we pray, pray with reverence, like a servant addresses a king, simply, directly, and sincerely. It's important that we understand that. Third thing is I want us to look at, and it's just a, a way that prayer causes, what prayer causes us to do. What does prayer cause us to do? Well, it, it particularly brings two things. The first thing is this, is to remember who he is. Prayer causes us to remember who he is. You see, 
when you and I get to a place to where we're recognizing God in the midst of our lives, we get to a place where we are asking Him to get involved in our lives. Does that mean that without us asking, He's not? No. It means that we recognize that He is in the midst of our lives. Jesus wants to be in the midst of our lives. So our job in prayer is to first recognize who He is. Well, who is He? He's the good teacher who teaches us how to pray. He is the one to whom we learn from these verses. But when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, what did he say? Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And if you forgive us our debts as we forget those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom of the honor and the glory forever. Amen. That's what he's taught us how to do. When Jesus said pray, you can get down in 20 seconds, and it covers everything that we're to pray about. And we'll talk about that in the 27th. But look at what he taught us in a short way to pray. And it's something that can be memorized, but it's what to be done in a sincere heart that is pleasing. Because prayer is to be pleasing to God. Second thing I want us what prayer causes us to do is to remember what he has done. Prayer causes us to remember what he has done. When we approach him, I think when I, when I approach him, I think, all right, Ben is nothing special. He is a sinful person who has done sinful things and is in need of saving. I recognize that what Jesus has done and his sacrifice on the cross for our and my sins, I realize that I am in need of forgiveness. I am in need of reconciliation. I need to be brought back into favor with God. And that happens when I recognize what he has done and who he is. He is the gospel. And the gospel can be said like this. God, G, our, O, S, sin, P, paid, E, everyone, L, life. God created the entire world and everything in it. Our sin is what separates us from God. Jesus came and he paid the price on the cross that we see right before us. And that's why it's up there, because it's that important. He paid everyone who all for those who believe as him and Savior, as Savior. He paid eternal life. So this is what I want us to understand, is that the moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, your eternity started then. It does not start when your life ends now. It, your soul, as a follower of Jesus, will not die. You will be with Jesus. And that's what I'm excited about. I'm excited to be Jesus. Jesus is the good teacher, humble, powerful, and wise. So as we close, I want us to remember that when we pray, communicate with the rewarder, and experience liberty that comes with a sincere heart, and remember what Christ has done. say this not because I, I, I'm not standing in front of you this morning. I say this as a lover of Jesus. <coughs> there is no one who has ever taught like Jesus taught. And the fact that we're going through the Sermon on the Mount and looking at his word as being the good teacher is important because he is the greatest teacher who ever lived. And it was very simple, yet complex. It was very direct, yet very broad. And covers all things. He is the good teacher who is humble, who is powerful, and who is wise. He changed the course of history. Every life who believes in him will be claimed by him. Did you catch that? Every life that 
that believes in him will be claimed by him and brought into relationship with him. His desire is to be known, and our job is to make him known. You see, my wife knows that I love her, but she most certainly wants to hear me say it. God knows what our prayers are. He also wants to hear us say it. He even knows them before we even think it. He wants us to recognize who he is and what he has done. Remember this. We, sometimes we, we get come to this, this place of, I'm not in a good place to Sometimes we think, I have to get into a certain mindset or a certain place in my life that I, that's when I will pray. I will pray then. Matthew 11 says this, verses 28 to 30. Come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Prayer causes us to carry his burden and his yoke, which is light. And those that we carry on ourselves that are heavy, we release to him. We bring to him. So if you are burdened, and if you are weary in this world, bring your yoke yeah. to him. Bring your burdens and carry his yoke. Yeah. Because it's light. And he has freedom. There's freedom in him. We're going to move into communion because communion really hits home here. It really causes us to remember what he has done. It causes us to remember what he has done. All throughout scripture, God promises, saying it over and over again, I will be with you. Do not fear. I will be with you, and I will bless you. Over and over in scripture, it says that. John 14, uh, verses uh, 15 and 17 says this, and although Jesus told the disciples of his death and departure, still he promised to send another, another helper, the Holy Spirit. Hear this promise. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom in the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and to be in you. God has sent us the Holy Spirit so that we can have an opportunity to be able to commune with him together. And he sent us this, this special sacrament and taught us how to approach the throne of God in recognition and remembrance. Remember what he has done. Remember who he is. Prayer causes us to do that. And so does communion. There's a reason that a lot of churches do this once a month. Because they believe that it's that important that we do it together and commune together, <coughs> remembering this. So today, as we partake in the sacrament, and the celebration. It's a memorial of his unconditional love throughout the suffering and sacrifice of our Lord Jesus. We just talked about what the gospel is. This is what it has brought about. The bread, what we're going to partake in, is a powerful symbol. It's a powerful symbol that helps us recognize the suffering that he went through on our behalf. He went through suffering 
on our behalf so that you and I could have freedom from our sins and, and have a relationship with the creator of the universe. His body was broken on our behalf so that we could have that. Communion is not, is not to be done lightly. It is to be done in remembrance and is to be taken very seriously. But to remember what he has done and to remember who he is. <coughs> Let's partake in the bread together. And as you do it, I'm going to ask you, as, as the guys come forward, I want us to do this. Just take time. We just gave you an opportunity to, to recognize of what he has done. So just quiet your hearts now. Between you and God, there's a burden that needs to be given to him. Do it now. Surrender it. If you and the created universe are good right now, celebrate that. Because there are times when you and the creator are good. And that's wonderful.